Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to another video. Um, today, couldn't quite think of a nice enough contour integral video to do, so we're just going to do a complex analysis proof. This one's a fairly nice one. It's not too tricky, I think. Um, yeah, haven't done one of these in a while. It's been like a few months, so yeah, they're pretty fun to do most of the time, given that you actually understand the thing. Otherwise, yeah, it's just confusion, pretty much. But yeah, what are we taking a look at today? We're taking a look at conformal automorphisms of C bar. So what on earth are those words if you haven't heard of them before? Conformal just means angle and orientation preserving. So if you have two lines in the complex plane, you map them over somewhere with a function, then the angle between those two lines stay the same and their orientation as well. In fact, the only condition you really need for that, if I remember this correctly, is that the derivative of your function is not equal to zero. So if you have a specific point where the derivative vanishes, then it's no longer conformal or angle preserving. And what exactly is automorphisms? Um, well, automorphism, in this case, it just means that your function is bijective and it's conformal both ways. So it's preserving this um, yeah, conformal property if you want here. Okay, so last time we took a look at conformal automorphisms of just a C, so complex plane, and those turn out to be just the linear maps. So today we're taking a look at the same thing but with C bar, so we're adding the point to infinity, and it turns out those are precisely the Mobius transformations. So conformal automorphisms of C, you usually denote it by ought of yeah, C bar like so, and we're going to prove today that this is precisely the set of Mobius transformations, so something like AZ plus B, over CZ plus D, where um, we have A, B, C, D. These guys are all complex numbers. And you also require that AD minus BC is not equal to zero. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have a constant, and constants aren't um, yeah, bijective. Okay, so this is essentially what we want to prove today. I'm going to try to prove this without my notes, um, so hopefully I don't make any silly mistakes or anything. If I do, I'll probably just um, put it in the comments somewhere. Um, yeah. How exactly would the proof of such a theorem, if you want to call it that, go? So proof. Um, let's first of all just choose some function f that belongs in C bar. And we're just going to show that it's, yeah, it takes this form over here. So we're going to let f be some function in ought of C bar. Okay, so f maps from C bar to C bar. And there's a few cases you could consider for this. Let's take a look at case one over here. Um, case one is when the point at infinity remains fixed. So in particular, if you take a look at f of infinity, um, the point at infinity remains at infinity. So you're allowed to scale things, you rotate things and whatnot. Um, but the point at infinity on the Riemann sphere, it doesn't change. And in fact, if infinity is a fixed point over here, basically all you're taking a look at is just automorphisms of C instead, because you don't really care about the point at infinity anymore. So I'll put quotation marks there because this is kind of roughly, um, but if you want f is now, you only take a look at automorphisms of c, but in one of those previous videos, we know what the automorphisms of C are. These are just the set of all linear maps. And the linear maps are definitely a part of the set over here. Linear maps are Mobius transformations. In particular, if you just take C equals yeah, 0 and D equals 1, for instance, this would definitely be a part of the set we have up over here. Okay, so that's nice. So now I can take a look at case two, and that's when infinity doesn't stay at infinity, it might get mapped somewhere else, so case two. F of infinity is, yeah, it gets mapped somewhere else, so maybe it's just part of the complex plane now, so it doesn't get mapped back to infinity. Okay, so if this is the case over here, now because the function is bijective, then it needs to be a point from C that gets mapped to infinity to fill its spot. So in particular, um, there exists some number, let's say Z naught in the complex plane, such that f of z naught gives you the point at infinity here. So in particular, z naught is going to be a singularity. So z naught is a singularity. And there's two types of singularities you could have. You could either have something called an essential singularity, which we discussed in one of the previous videos when we took a look at carcerati weierstrass theorem. So this could be an essential singularity. Or this could just be some kind of pole with finite order. So finite order pole. And to be precise, I should probably say isolated singularity because we're just mapping one point to infinity. Okay, so these are the two cases we could have. And it turns out Z0, it can't be an essential singularity. It's literally impossible. And to see why, you just need to take a look at the carcerati weierstrass theorem because what exactly does it say? It says that if we have an essential singularity, you can just take a look at some neighborhood of Z0 and the image of the function f in that neighborhood takes on every single complex value. 
Okay, but if it does take on every single complex value, then all the other points outside of that neighborhood, well, there's not really anywhere to map to because your function f over here, we assumed that it was bijective. So if z0 was an essential singularity, it would just be a contradiction to the fact that f is a bijective function. So impossible by the Cassirati virus for us theorem. Okay, so therefore, so this implies that z0 must be a pole. And let's say of some finite order, let's say um, is an mth order pole, where yeah, m is some integer between 1 and infinity, it has to be finite order. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to show that z0 it's not just any mth order pole, it's actually just a simple pole, which means this m over here that has to be equal to 1. So how exactly can we study the order of a pole? Well, a nice thing you could do is you could consider the reciprocal function instead. So z0 so far is a pole of f. What happens if you take a look at the reciprocal of f by defining, so let's say we let some g of z now be equal to 1 divided by f of z. Okay, and just one quick observation over here as well. G is still also a conformal map. Why exactly is that? Well, it's because the f was a conformal map and taking the reciprocal, so the one over z function is a conformal map. That's something you could check quite easily because the derivative is non-vanishing. So the one over z function is a conformal map. It's also an automorphism because the derivative is non-vanishing. And so one over z is definitely a bijective function. So one over z is inside of this ought of c bar set over here. And if you compose two functions in this ought of c bar set, you still get a function in ought of c bar. And um, it's because this guy over here, it's a group. Okay, so that's just a nice fact to keep in mind. So in particular, g would also appear in the set ought of c bar. Now we said before that z0 was a pole of the function f, so if we take the reciprocal over here, um, this means that z0 is a, or is an nth order 0 of the function g. Because basically if you plug z0 into here, f of z0 was supposed to be infinity by assumption, so 1 over infinity is going to be 0. Okay, so we have this condition now. Now what exactly does it mean for a function to have a nth order zero, we can use the definition of an nth order zero. Um, in particular, if you take your function g of z, you should be able to rewrite it as some function um, z minus z zero raised to the nth power. So roughly speaking, you're taking out all the factors that would give you a zero if you plug in z naught, and then you multiply it by some function, let's call h of z over here, where h is some analytic function and also a h of z0 is not going to be equal to 0 because we've already factored out all the factors that give you 0. So in particular, h of z0 is not equal to 0. So this is, if you've taken a complex analysis course or take a look at the definition of Wikipedia, this is literally the definition of an nth order 0. And now that we kind of reframed the z0 point over here as a 0 of some function, an nth order 0, we could try to prove that m over here must be equal to 1. So how can we do that? Well, we're going to use the fact that g over here has to be a conformal automorphism. Now, what does it mean for a function to be a conformal automorphism? It means it's well, one of the properties is that the derivative is nowhere 0 in the complex plane. So we're going to do a bit of, I guess, contradiction over here, because if you take now g prime of z, what happens if you differentiate this guy? Well, we just product rule this. So it's this guy first times the derivative of this z minus z naught raised to the nth power. So h of z, and if you differentiate this guy, you get an m out here, and then a z minus z naught raised to the m minus 1. And then you have something like this guy times the derivative of h. So z minus z naught times the derivative of h of z, like so. And notice you have this z minus z naught factors everywhere. So in particular, if you sub z naught into this function g, so g prime of z naught over here, you're going to get, well, this is going to be zero. Well, this last term over here, that's definitely going to vanish to zero because you have a z minus z naught. Actually, I forgot an m over here. There's a z minus z naught factor there. That's going to vanish, so this guy goes to zero. Now, how about this guy over here? Notice if m is greater than 1, so if m is equal to 2, 3, 4, and so on, you're going to get this z minus z naught factor. That's going to yeah, just vanish when you plug in z naught. So this guy, there's two things that could happen. You could get a zero if m is greater than 1. Now, how about if m is equal to 1? Well, we're going to get a 1 minus 1 here. That's gone, so you're just left with m times h of z. So m is equal to 1, so that's just going to be h of z. 
or z naughts like so, right? And this is m is equal to one. Uh huh. So what do we see over here? If m is greater than one, then we see there's a point on our function g where our derivative vanishes, which is a bit of a problem because if your map is a conformal automorphism, the derivative can't vanish. Um, but if m is equal to one, then you get some h of z naught. But h of z naught is not equal to zero, which is perfect. So because we need the property um, that g is conformal to hold, it must be that m is equal to one. So we have m that has to be equal to one over there. Or in particular, if you want to write it this way, z naught, that's going to be a simple zero. Of the function, what was it? Of the function g. Okay, so we've established that z naught is a simple pole of g. Now because f was just the reciprocal of g, you could say, um, z naught's going to be a simple pole of the function f actually. So z naught is a simple pole of f. So now we can take a look at the definition of a simple pole of a function. So, so what does it mean for a function to have a simple pole? Uh, well, we can define a new function, let's say um, L of z over here, and we define this to be z minus z naught times the function f of z. So if your function f has a simple pole at z naught, if you multiply it by z minus z naught, um, it turns out this guy is going to be an entire function. And it turns out this function L over here is also conformal. You can check that by taking the derivative of this guy and it shouldn't be equal to zero anywhere. So it's entire um, and it's conformal. And we can also take a look at this guy a bit more carefully as well because f of z over here, if you take a look at the limits as z approaches infinity, let's say, it's going to be some finite value because this was um, in particular due to case two over here. Infinity got mapped away from the point of infinity, so another finite point had to fill its spot. So in particular, this function f over here, this is a less than infinity for z at infinity over here, or as z approaches infinity if you want. Now, if you take a look at this linear factor, so z minus z naught, because this guy is linear, it actually has a simple pole at infinity. And this is quite easy to see if you just replace a z with a 1 over z over here and you evaluate 0. So this factor has a simple pole at infinity. And because at infinity this f of z is just going to be a finite number, overall this l of z here, this guy is also going to have a simple pole at infinity. So I guess I could just combine the arrow over here. The function l is going to have a simple pole at infinity. Okay, so with our function L, what do we know so far? We know that it's an entire function, um, it's also conformal, and it has a simple polar infinity. And using this one vector over here, we can basically deduce what type of function this L of z over here has to be. Um, I kind of proved it in one of the previous video, which I'll link in the description. It's a fairly simple proof anyways, but essentially, if your function has a pole at infinity, then it has to be a polynomial. And in fact, the order of that polynomial is determined by the order of the pole at infinity. So because we have the first order pole at infinity, so a simple pole, it means that this polynomial has to be of exactly order one, right? So that means L of z has to be a linear function, which is pretty cool. So this implies, um, using this factor over here, L of z um, has to be a linear function. Right, so in particular, we should be able to write L of z as something like this. So L of z is equal to a z plus b for some complex constants a and b. Actually, a can't be equal to zero, otherwise you're just gonna get a constant. But what exactly is L of z? L of z is z minus z naught times f of z. So we have z minus z naught. This guy times the function f of z is equal to a times z plus b. But now we want to kind of solve for the function f of z so we can divide this through on both sides. Um, so f of z over here, that's going to be equal to a z plus b over yeah, z minus z naught. But this is really boils down to just the quotient of two linear functions. So this is equivalent to writing in the form a z plus b over um, c z plus d like so. And that's basically where we wanted to end up to for today because this is exactly a Mobius transformation. And of course you don't want um, 
AD minus BC equals to zero. Otherwise, you get a constant um, to see where that comes from. You could just take, let's say, the ratio B over A, and you don't want that to be equal to the ratio D over C. Otherwise, you're essentially getting the same linear function. And if you just rearrange this a little bit, you, you get to this um, yeah, in equation, I guess, over here. Okay, so that essentially proves that um, all automorphisms of C, because formal automorphisms have this form. And if you really want to check set equality, then you have to show that this function over here, if you pick some random Mobius transformation, then it lies in the automorphism set, which is fairly simple to prove because this guy is definitely invertible and it's, yeah, it's conformal. We can take the derivative and it's not equal to zero. Um, so I guess with this proof that we have so far, this would be proving that ORT C is a subset of this other set, but um, the other direction is very straightforward anyways. Okay, so that's pretty much all for this video. You'll probably end up doing some more Mobius transformation videos in the future as well because they're pretty cool to study. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all for the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you want to see more complex analysis, proofs and contour integration and whatnot, then subscribe to the channel. I have like a bunch more uploads I have plans that I still need to write solutions for and whatsoever. Um, so yeah, they'll come up whenever I have time to film them. Um, but yeah, up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone in the next one. Bye bye.